Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ben and this is the Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast. Hey family, I hope you're well wherever you are and you got that thin blue smoke rolling. This is episode 15 of season 6, my US road trip part 2. In this season, I kick things off with two weeks in New Orleans. There, I head to a couple of competitions and spend some time hanging out with the who's who of Southern Barbecue. From there, it's up to Kansas City for four days of Barbecue Nirvana at the National Barbecue and Grilling Association's Annual Conference and Excellence Awards. The final two weeks of the journey see us head into Arkansas for some R&R, including bass fishing, monster trucks, a state cook-off association competition, an AK-47, and a brush with a tornado. And of course, you're coming with me. If you haven't heard of the State Cook-Off Association, you might well be living under a rock. It is the fastest growing competitive cooking association in the world and is born completely from the work of Brett Galloway and Ken Phillips. In this interview, we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the SCA and learn some shortcuts from their experience for those of you out there looking to follow in their footsteps. With summer coming up, it's time for a new favorite barbecue t-shirt, and I've got just the thing for you. Drawing inspiration from the iconic barbecue pop culture art by Gil Elvgren, the Hail Mary tee is black like all good barbecue shirts should be, comes in both men's and women's cuts in a variety of sizes, and of course, features Mary. She likes her barbecue smoky, spicy, and just a little bit naughty. Check her out now at smokinghotconfessions.com slash shop. I'd also like to invite you to join us at the Smoking Hot Confessions community on Facebook. If you're looking for a barbecue group full of open-minded people who just love to help each other out, the Smoking Hot Confessions community is a great place to continue the conversation. Finally, however you listen to this episode, please subscribe, rate, and review the show. It really helps me spread that barbecue love. So without further ado, a grab yourself a perfectly grilled ribeye and a beer so thick you can stand a spoon up in it, and join me on the whirlwind journey that is the State Cook-Off Association. This is the internationally awarded Smoking Hot Confessions Barbecue Podcast with your host, Ben Arnott. How long has it been since your last confession? The Smart Fire is an essential barbecue accessory for anyone who loves their barbecue but still wants to spend as much time as possible with their friends and family. It's a Wi-Fi and Bluetooth pit controller which allows you to monitor and control the ambient temperature of your charcoal smoker from the convenience of the purpose-built smartphone app. Just tell the SmartFire what you're cooking, set your target temperatures and let the SmartFire take care of the rest. It's got a range of world first features. 5 volt power makes it easy to run wherever you are and cloud connectivity means you can be at the shops picking up last minute supplies or at your kids soccer match and still keeping an eye on the cook. To get your Smart Fire and start spending more of your free time doing more of the things you love, head to smartfirebbq.com and use the code word SMOKINGHOTCONFESSIONS, one word, at checkout to save 10%. That's smartfirebbq.com and use the code SMOKINGHOTCONFESSIONS, one word, at checkout to save 10%. Ladies and gentlemen, I am very excited. I've got with me right now Brett Galloway, one of the co-founders of the State Cook-Off Association, the SCA. That's the state competition that's been taking the world by storm. So, mate, I want to say g'day and thanks for taking the time to join me on the show and welcome to The Confessional. Man, thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk today and uh, can't wait. Mate, it's going to be a good time. So let's kick things off. What was the last thing that you barbecued? Well, last night I did a uh, chicken. On, I have a uh, Flaming Coals rotisserie, and so I did a chicken on there last night. Interesting, a Flaming Coals rotisserie. Did you bring that back with you from Australia? We did. We were in at Meatstock, and we met him in Sydney. And actually, uh, he, Cameron brought that to our uh, hotel overnight. We met him that night. He brought it to our hotel, and we left at like 7 in the morning. <laughs> It was really nice of them. <laughs> yeah, it's, I like it. I, I used it for my daughter's uh, graduation party. I had 10 different proteins and four vegetables I cooked that day. I'm starting to 
really enjoy it. Yeah. So what what is it about the the particular design of the flaming coals that you like so much? Well, I like the word history on it. I like being able to, you know, I can control what how much heat I'm there. I can use if I'm using the BMB char logs if I want if I have something high, you know, give me a higher higher flame that way. But I I generally use a briquette on it and I just like being able to try different things, see what I can cook on it. Right. And it's so- a show every time you use it. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So, but I, I've got a small grill collection. I, I have, I just got number thirty-seven yesterday. So, I've got thirty-seven different grills, and this one is the one that's my, uh, that's kind of my favorite at the moment. Thirty-seven. I thought I was getting up there with fifteen, but sir, I take off <laughs> my hat to you. Well, you know, I could, I could do a lot worse things. I collect, you know, I find them here and there. I find them on Facebook and different places. And now it's getting to where people are like, Hey, I saw this grill. And I'm like, perfect. <laughs> so, so which grill are you most addicted to then? Like what, when people reach out to you on Facebook and they're like, Hey, I found a X, Y, Z and you just can't resist it. What's that one? Well, the ones that people are sending me, I don't, I don't have a lot of the older Weber's, um, you know, the, uh, uh, the Australian Weber club over there love those guys they're uh they're kind of keeping an eye out for me also but they introduced me to a guy here in america that can help me out with some of those but i i like collecting i have one that's a shape of a budweiser bow tie i've got a budweiser beer can i just got a miller like one yesterday so i like the ones that are maybe branded for uh, marketing purposes but i like just collecting those because no but not a lot of people have those yeah, I saw a really interesting looking one pop up on Facebook there. Um, it wasn't a for sale post, so just uh, just relax. Um, it was a um, it was just someone's post that they put up. It was a it was a PK grill that looked shaped like a like a Razorback, and it made me think of the Arkansas Hogs. Yeah, that you know PK being made in Arkansas, that was something made years ago. And that, if I if I remember right, I've seen that grill in person. And I think that's actually an electric grill. Oh, really? I believe it is. Because I, I seen that grill in uh, Little Rock a couple of years ago at, a, at the uh, PK cook-off. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. You don't see those too often. Those are that. Uh, that's the only one I've seen. No, I was hoping to, that I might be able to sort of track one down and send it to my uncle-in-law who's over there. He's mad for the Arkansas uh, Razorbacks or Hogs, I forget what they're called, but uh, yeah, Razorbacks, you're right. The Razorbacks, yeah. He, he he's got the number plate uh, frames on his car. He's got the bumper <laughs> stickers. You walk in through the front door of the house. There's the doormat. Um, he's even got a slow cooker, which is a Razorbacks um, slow cooker in the in the cupboard that he pulls out to cook up chili for the game days. And yeah, <laughs> he's he's utterly obsessed. That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm. That's great. Yeah, there's a lot of unique girls out there if you just kind of look around and sometimes people don't know what they have and so you can get a really good deal on them. Actually, my desk at my office is two Weber kettles, two 22-inch Webers. I, the tops are off them and then I've got a, you know, a flat, I don't know, it's basically a desktop that sits on top of the Webers. So you, my desk is two girls. Even. That's cool. That's so cool. <laughs> You know, you know, you're walking into a cooker's office when you see that. Oh yeah, yeah. It's uh, the agenda of the meeting becomes very clear. Yes, sir. (laughs) So you're one of the founders of the SCA. Can you fill us in on uh, what the SCA is for those of us that uh, that may be uninitiated and what you do there? Sure. Um, The SCA stands for Steak Cook Off Association. Um, You know the I was a competition cooker and I, I started off cooking steak and I used to be a restaurant manager. And this first event we went to, you're underneath a 10 by 10. It was in this little town, in central Texas. And you were just lined up on the streets and they do a festival. It's been there for 25 years. And man, I just had a blast. The public was coming by and you were talking to people and we were handing out samples and it, it felt just like being in a restaurant. And then, okay, yeah, by the way, it's time to turn in your competition steak. 
So we had a blast. We didn't know how we did at the event, but we had a lot of fun. And then we went to another one and I was hooked. And so we, we found out that there was only nine steak cook-offs in the country that year. And we cooked all of them because we were just in and just love the atmosphere, but there wasn't enough cook-offs. And then the real problem was the rules were different at every event. So you'd go to one event and it was this set of rules. So you'd go to another event and it was that set of rules. There was no KCBS. There was no ABA, uh, FBA, whatever organization runs barbecue cook-offs in your area. There was nothing for steak. And so we talked to some of the promoters and said a couple of promoters we knew. And they, were, they opened up the vault to us and kind of showed us how things were done. And so we tried our first event and just had a blast. And the teams really liked the changes we made. Um, we came at it from a cooker's view. And so there were certain things just didn't fit with the process. And we were able to change some of those things. And then kind of took off from there. But we focus on ribeye steaks and ancillaries. Now, our ancillaries are all over the map. I mean, it could be, I mean, we haven't done bin chicken yet, but we've done a lot of crazy things. <laughs> <laughs> You've spent too much time in Australia if you know what the bin chicken is. Yeah, I think I've been there five times the last three years, six times. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we got plenty of them up on the Gold Coast. I can't stand them. <laughs> They're a nuisance, I hear. Oh, my my wife's uh, from America. Her family's from Arkansas. And uh, when we first moved to the Gold Coast, she kept going, but, oh, these beautiful birds, their white bodies and black heads and their big... Yeah. That their big sort of long bowed beak, and I was like, hate those damn things. <laughs> that's funny. Oh, they're awful, yeah, bloody have, things. That's funny. That that's kind of where you know it's we focus on steak, and we just kind of created standardized rules, and it started there. And um, you know, Ken and I had a cook team together. Ken's the co-founder. We. Had, you know, all of us started at this first cook-off and it just, you know, we started with that one event and then our, we really got our opportunity with the National Barbecue Association. Uh, we had met some people and they invited us to run an event there. Well, but you were actually at MBBQA this year. I was, yeah. You got, to, and I was actually, I was there for one day. The, the first, I uh, was in that competition. Oh gosh, what was it? The kitchen one. Oh, Were you there the very first um, day, Wednesday? Wednesday night. They did the uh, culinary fight club. Culinary fight club. Yeah, I was there and competed in that. And then I, that's all I was there. I left the next morning early and headed to Pennsylvania for an event. And then I left Pennsylvania, headed to Wisconsin. And I was in four states in three days. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was a whirlwind, but Ken was there. He got to speak at a couple of things and MBBQA has been really good to us. And just by going to MBBQA is how we met, you know, Mark Lambert, Mark Lambert has events that he runs his fundraisers for operation barbecue relief. And we've done events at the shed and, you know, that first event we had down in San Marcos, Texas really kickstarted us and, you know, I, I talked about having nine events in the country before we started. Well, that opened up the doors, and we were able to have 19 sanctioned events our first year. So it it really gave us that boost to get things going. We met the right people. One minute went from 19 to 47 to one to 87 to 116 to 232. Which brings us to current. Here we're in year six. And as of yesterday, I was, well, I got two more overnight. So that makes 371 for this year. Oh, wow. That's incredible. It's, yeah, it's crazy. It's been really, it's been a, uh, it's been a ride and we've learned a lot. And, you know, one of the big challenges we face is every year, you know, you're almost doubling in size every year or at least 50%. So what worked the first year didn't work the second year and didn't work the third for our systems and behind the scenes. And that, that was a really big challenge and still is. 
I'll bet. And just trying to trying to manage something of that of this size, you know, little things that I just have to keep changing and evolving, which is great because you know, honestly, some of the things I thought I was really good at in the past, I wasn't really good at. And some of the things I thought I was really weak, I've been better at. So, you know, for Ken and I, we're both, you know, it's that constant learning process, which is, you know, something I really like. Yeah, that's that's incredibly rapid growth. What's that what's that ride like? It's you know, it is a uh, it's interesting. We got a call one day from Jay Beaumont and Jay said, Hey, if you, it actually was on Facebook. And he said, have you ever thought about coming to Australia? And we'd already done the same thing in Europe, Kerry Havinga, which is kind of the big, he helped win KCBS to Europe. And, um, he, he reached out to me via Facebook and I, I, man, I've, this is how I, Facebook has kind of connected the cooking world in a way. That's how I met, how we ended up going up to Europe for the first time. We went to Amsterdam and then Jay contacted me and said, Hey, did you ever think about coming over here? And then we talked on the phone. And next thing you know, I'm coming to meat stock. Meat stocks like the Cirque du Soleil at cook-offs. Oh, yeah. you know, I mean, it's, there's a, there's a Harley Davidson rides over here. There's a, you know, you've got bands over here. There's the cookers are over here. There's just everywhere you look, there's something going on and it's, you know, I found out Jay took a very different approach to his event than some other people have, say, here in America. And I, you know, I really liked his approach to it. But that that's how we got to Australia. And that's been finding ways to go into new countries and then, okay, you've got to identify some people to help develop it there. And you know, we're lucky we've got Trent in Australia that's, he does a lot and I don't know if you know Demelsa. She does a lot of work with ABA. Um, you know, developing that and friendships with Adam and Jay, and now we're partners with them in Australia. They help promote our events over there, and um, they're they're a great partnership with us. Yeah, the uh, the SCA comps have proven to be really popular over here because they just they dovetail so nicely into our traditional long format ABA competitions. It's, um, it's really fun. I've, I've really enjoyed the ones that I've been to. Well, you know, you're cooking pretty much, you're cooking the same four proteins when you're cooking ABA. I mean, you, you, I, I do like that you're able to cook. Okay. You can cook lamb and you can cook different parts of it in the same thing with beef. You know, KCBS is a lot more restricting on what they cook. So, they do have that flexibility, but, you know, being able to cook steak, everyone thinks they're the king of the cul-de-sac or uh, what's the phrase? Everyone's the best cook in their, you know, their neighborhood. And this gives them the opportunity, that guy that he may not be confident enough to go out and cook a whole, you know, beef, chicken, ribs, and lamb. But the guy is confident that he thinks, man, I cook the best steak in my neighborhood. So that's, that's, kind of our customer is that guy that thinks he's the best best on the block and then guys that have already proven they are that are out there cooking that competition barbecue it's just another challenge for them yeah it it gives them something to do on the uh, on the bump in days mm-hmm. it's awesome yeah so how many countries are you in now right now I, we're in 15 countries wow we just added, uh, we had our first event in Budapest, Hungary. I mean, if you told me we were going to have a steak cook-off in Budapest, Hungary <laughs> five years ago, I said, you're crazy. But, you know, we're we're in Canada. We're down in Mexico. Of course, we're in the States. We're in Australia, uh, New Zealand, Belgium, Germany, Austria. Oh, man, Hungary. I don't, I don't forgetting a couple here but uh, we actually just did one in february in the bahamas also that was a lot of fun but that would have been a rough gig wouldn't it it was i don't know if you saw the pictures but the person that put on the event uh it's brad from girl greats helped us with this event and we lined up 20 weber kettles right along a curve of the 
of the beach. Huh. So there's a shot of all these Webers just lined up, palm trees and the ocean in the background. Beautiful. It was it was amazing. And they provided the grills, so it really all you had to do is bring your spices down. He had grill grates, temperature gauges. He had uh, the grills and charcoal. So we had 25 teams that came from. Actually, they were all from America for this one, but they all came down and just had a blast. And now they're saying we want another one. I'll bet they are so probably, a weekend away in the Bahamas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't hard. What's neat is, you know, you'll see a lot of the people come out as couples and some of the guys that are out there almost every week running around doing these things may not always have their wives with them. But at this event, you know, people were out there with their wives and their kids and it was just great to see everyone out there and the stress. There was no stress. You were at the beach. It was great. Beautiful. So traveling around the world as much as you do administering these competitions, what differences have you noticed between the different countries? You know, the meat is probably our biggest difference. Um, just the over there, the loins or the, uh, the ribs are smaller. You know, I'm sure in bar- competition barbecue, I saw your, your spare ribs are a lot smaller, your baby backs, but Very even much. the steaks are not as, you know, they're not as wide. They're, you've got smaller cattle. So that's the biggest, you know, and, and you got your beef is a lot leaner than say ours is. Unfortunately here in America, we like some fatty ribeyes, but that's, that's the way our cattle are raised. Um, you know, and as far as process, it's, it's very similar in America. The, uh, the height of barbecue, I'm going to say was six or seven years ago. Remember when pit masters was really on, was hitting on television and numbers were huge in barbecue. And that's when I was, I was cooking a lot of barbecue. I probably did 25 a year. Um, plus the nine steak across that year. Wow. So I, I was, it was really big, but now Australia is almost where we were six years ago, you know, for, for barbecue, it's just on fire over there. Um, Japan is starting to catch on. We've got a couple events in Japan. Uh, and one of the neat things is we did a class and had an interpreter. We did a judging class. And then I did a steak lesson for, there's probably 30 people in the class. And they, I mean, they were literally standing around me taking notes as I grilled. It was really the passion they had for it. And then it came time for our event. I ran a cook meeting and I walked out there and this was really neat. I came to a table and there's five guys sitting around with a phone. I just kind of walked around them peeked over there and they walked, they were watching Malcolm Reed, how to barbecue, right? (laughs) His video on ribeye steak. That's cool. That was one of the neatest things to see is, you know, no matter where you're at, guys are all, you know, they're looking to improve what they're doing. Yeah. I met um, a Japanese team when I was over in Houston competing in at the world's barbecue championships Mm -hmm. in 2018. And I can't remember their name, but apparently they're there every year and they were just so gung ho about, uh, about barbecue. And I think they actually, um, I think they won the t-shirt design category at this year's NBBQA. (laughs) uh, Shogun, Shogun, Shogun barbecue. Yeah. 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 Miyako and Tamio. They're actually our partners and also in, uh, Japan. Oh, there you go. Small they, world. Yeah. They're the ones who brought us over there and they're, they're helping us spread it in Japan. He, he's a pretty successful businessman in Japan with a lot of different ventures, but he has a passion for barbecue and now he has a passion for growing. And so it's been really interesting working with them and trying to find different ways to communicate. And, you know, what the hard part in Japan is they can't give out cash prizes. So here or there, you know, that thousand dollars, that thousand dollar first prize prize is that carrot. Man, I want that thousand bucks. That draws people out. Well, in Japan, all they can give away is prizes because of the government. So you may win a a Weber, you can win a three hundred dollar bottle of sake with it, and you know things like that. But it, you know, far as people winning money, they're not allowed. That's really strange. Yeah, that was one of our biggest challenges there, you know, for him getting started. Um, But all of our events have had 
25 to 35 teams over there. Wow. We've just, we've had a couple the first year and we had a couple this year. Uh, so we're hoping for a couple more before the year is out, but it, it's a, just a different, and the, the little things we figure out everywhere we're a different country we're in. Yeah, that's fascinating. I want to loop back to something that you had mentioned earlier. You mentioned the ancillary categories. I I love them because the, the degree of creativity that I see is just incredible. So what's the the wildest ancillary you've ever seen? Well, the guys, oh, they got some weird ones. You know, we've done deviled eggs. <laughs> deviled eggs is kind of weird. You know, that was a southern thing. So we did that in Mississippi. Um, down in Houston, we've done salmon because he had fresh salmon that they had brought in. But kind of weird one. We do goat in George West, Texas. That's South Texas. It's really dry and arid. And you'll see some really thin cattle walking around and goats. And so they want they wanted to do goat. So we do goat guisada, which is goat and grape, like kind of a goat and gravy. And then they do barbecue goat. Mm. And, you know, I'm a fan of good cooked goat, but when you have 60 teams turning in goat, you're, I'm not a fan of um, some really strange goat being turned in. <laughs> it, it's it's really interesting seeing some of the turn ins. And, you know, I was last night, I was shopping in the grocery store and I, I looked down and I saw this, this nice, it was beef. What do they call them? The country, they call them country style beef ribs kind of like a country style pork rib, but I, it made me think of Adam, Adam Roberts, because he and I were walking through Melbourne one night and it was kind of late and we were maybe have a little bit to drink and we were looking for kebabs. And I'm like, why haven't we done kebabs? Ooh, yeah. So, yeah, that'd be a great one. So we're going to, I'm going to have the Adam Roberts kebab contest. Ah, <laughs> there you go. So, and it, it could be anything. We're doing tacos out, you know, San Diego. We did tacos. Um, we're going to do s'mores. We do a, an event called the Winter Wonderland. Cook, and that's, we're in Texas. It's, it's near Christmas. And usually we're in shorts at this event, but we call it Winter Wonderland. We give out really neat prizes that are Christmas themed. And, um, but that one, we're going to do s'mores. I don't know if you, have you had s'mores? I know about s'mores, but I've never had one because heartbreakingly, I'm actually allergic to chocolate. Oh, man. I, that wouldn't hurt my feelings if I was. I'm not a, not a chocolate fan, but my wife is. That would be heartbreaking for her. Yeah, well, see, my, my wife loves it because that means she gets double the chocolate. <laughs> That's a bonus for her. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we like keeping it creative and just trying different things. You know, the cook's kind of get tired of the same thing sometimes. And the ancillaries, we've intentionally created our rules very, very wide. Because people are like, well, where are the rules? Well, they're right there. You must, you know, appetizers. You must turn in six appetizers, a minimum of six pieces or portions. And it can't be a dessert. Well, can I do this? Does it say you can't? Go for it. Creativity is a, a quarter of your score. So we encourage that creativity and guys just take it, push it as far as they can. And that we really like that just to see the different things and guys just go, I don't know. It opens a lot of thought for them. So. Yeah. It's really sort of opens up the, the, the palette of options for them. Um, some of the things I've seen are just, just really blew me away. And there was a competition recently down in Melbourne at, uh, at, at Q club. And they mm-hmm. actually um, encouraged the ancillaries at, as much as they did the steak. They put $1,000 prize money on all of them. I saw that. I, actually, they're going to do a third event this year. Yeah. And I got I got an email from – or a message from Trent. And, gosh, she told me and they're going to be neat. One of them is anything ribs. So if you want to turn in lamb ribs, you can. If you want spare ribs, you want baby back ribs. I mean, any type of rib you can turn in. Interesting. That that hasn't been done before. So I think that'll be kind of interesting. And, you know, I, same thing. We encourage Trent. I said, man, if there's something locally that you want to do, 
go for it. They did oysters up on the coast last year in Australia. Yeah. So anything, you know, that it just adds a regional flair to certain things. We did jambalaya in Louisiana. Oh, that would have been good. I want, I would have loved to judge that one. Yeah. When we, when, when we first did, um, I, I like to try out some of the new ones at some of the events that we actually host. On one of the years at Winter Wonderland, uh, we did grilled cheese. And Ken, the co-founder, he loves grilled cheese. And so he's like, I'm judging, I'm judging. I said, all right. And I, my wife wanted to judge that. So they got in there and afterwards I said, well, what'd you think? And they're like, well, I didn't have a grilled cheese. If somebody just turned it in cheese and bread, I would have loved it. But the guys, <laughs> I mean, they were two inches thick and had, you know, some had shrimp on them. And one of them was the cheese was bright red on one side and bright blue on the other. Oh, wow. And they said it was, they said it just played with your mind. It, if you didn't see the color, he said it would have tasted amazing, but it was in your head that you're eating blue cheese. Oh, okay. Like blue colored cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh, those, they're just fun. And it, the cooks seem to like that different challenges and being able to be creative. I'll bet they do. So what's been the biggest challenge in the SCA journey so far? Our biggest challenge is just changing every year. Um, we've, we've always been good at listening to the teams because we, we were a cook team when we started. And so every year I keep a log book. It's just a spiral notebook and I write the next year on it and it sits right to the right of my desk. If you call me and say, Hey man, I think, I think you should be able to, um, we use steak selection as an example. When we first started, as you entered the event, that was, that was your order of steak selection. So what we found was guys, if they didn't enter early, they thought, well, I don't have as good a chance if I enter late. So it discouraged people entering late. Well, the team's made a suggestion and we wrote it down in the book. At the end of the year, we're reading through the suggestions. And we're like, that makes sense. Okay. So then we changed it to where, okay, well, we're going to, we're going to draw poker chips out of a bag. And I have a little crown oil bag and they reach in, they grab a chip. And then that was your order. You selected your stakes. So it would go one, say you had 30 teams. It was one through 30. And then you'd start over one through 30. Well, then the next year, the team suggested again. And they said, well, can we go one through 30 and then 30 through one? So the guy that picks first also picks last. And the guy in the middle picks two. So really everyone's getting one of the best and one of the rest on the stakes. Um, not to say the second ones are bad, but one of the everybody has what they're looking for on the stakes. And so this gives the teams, everyone's going to get one of the best stakes on the table pretty much for sure. And then they start the line reverses. And this was all because of teams suggestions. And, you know, we couldn't keep evolving if we didn't listen to the teams and that, you know, it's a challenge. You, sometimes you think you're coming up with something good. And we put it to a panel of people when we make a decision like this, I'll run it by certain people. What do you think on this? And really our filter for any changes, Kim and I sit in that office or we're in on an airplane. All right, let's go. And I'll take one side and he'll take the other. And we look at it from the lens of a cook and a promoter and just try to blow holes in it. Any decision, how does this work? How does this affect the teams? How does this affect fairness? How does this affect the promoters? And putting those together, we're able to sometimes we just, without having to put anything into test, we can go, this isn't going to work. And it, it's kind of a different system, but it, it seems to work for us. And that little book helps us. To me, that's, that's a, it's a big challenge. Any decision you make when it was small, it was this big, but now with, you know, with 6,000 members and 12,000 people that have competed in SCA events, um, you know, it becomes a pretty big challenge to make any change. Well, when you're in 15 countries across the world, it literally has a global impact. Yeah, very true. It, that it is the uh, that's the hard one to do. It, you've really got to got to think through it. And Ken and I are pretty good at going back and forth on those things. We don't have a board at SCA. Um, Ken and I started it. We, we've watched too many organizations with boards and they're deadlocked. They can't get anything done. 
we always joke when we were, sometimes we've been having a margarita after a, an event, um, sitting down with a margarita and talking and we're like, good board meeting. And we'll make a decision right there if we see something needs to be addressed. Perfect. I mean, it's the decisions aren't fueled by margaritas. Don't get me wrong, but <laughs> it could be, you know, that it could be anywhere. And not having that board allows us to react when we, we feel we need to react to something rather than, okay, let's get the board together. And, you know, six months later, you make a decision that could have been made while you're having that margarita and chips. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Definitely sounds like the way to go. So tell us about a highlight that you've had with the SCA. Highlights. You know, they're probably not what you would think they are. Um, I, To me, I, I celebrate the little things more than the big things. You know, going to Australia, sure, that's a highlight. That was great. Going to Europe, you know, going to these different countries. But it's the small things for me that really make a difference. When we started cooking, it was me... A um, guy named Ward from church, and I talked Ken into it and our families. And it was 19 of us at that first event. So for us, it was about family and having fun, being out in front of everybody. And so, probably my highlights I remember in year two, there was a 68 year old man, a guy named Tony, that I'm friends with. I used to cook barbecue with him. He won an event, and I put my arm around Tony to take a picture, and he was trembling just shaking. He was so excited. <laughs> and just, I still remember that today. Um, and there's, you know, we've got some people, a gentleman up in Minnesota and he sent me a nice letter one day and said, right. he said, I didn't have a whole lot of friends and um, he was pretty shy. And he said, SCA has changed that for him. And now he has friends all over the country and now actually knows people all over the world, you know, and they'll message each other. And he said, that's helped change his little world you know, the way he looked at things and people. And to me, I mean, that, that was huge for us. Just hearing that keeps us motivated. And then recently I posted a picture and he has a son and I, if he's listening, uh, forgive me, but I think he's autistic, um, but he's some, has a special need. And uh, he, he's been teaching his son how to cook. And his son tur- just turned 18 and cooked in his first SCA couple of weeks ago and he got a call. Oh, his wow. autistic son did and the crowd went nuts because everyone knows his son. He's always out there with his dad. And to me, that was a highlight seeing that. Yeah. Having those kind of impacts on, on family life like that, that's just got to be incredible. Yeah, to me, that's those things like that. Are, and Ken feels the same way. Just seeing those things like, we were we were cookers. We love cooking. I love competing. I mean, it it kills me not to cook in SGA. I'd love to be out there cooking with the guys I used to know, you know, or guys I'm friends with. But I I don't believe in cooking in your own organization. I just if I was to win, people would say, "Well, Brett's a world champion. He should have won." But the guys that don't know me would say, "Oh, he won because he's the founder." And to avoid that perception. I just choose not to cook an SCA. Yeah. And then I made that decision from the beginning. Just perception becomes reality sometimes and you don't want to, I don't want to get that false illusion. You know, we're, we're totally blind judging. When I go to awards, I get up there and we call by ticket number rather than team name. And so, it, well, you've cooked. There's magic in here in six, seven, two, and there's nine people that think they have a chance. It could be two one, two four, and you call that last number, and you just see somebody jumps up, and there's eight other people who are just like, "Oh, so close!" Yeah, yeah, you can actually hear an audible gasp in the crowd as you get to that second to last number. Yeah, it's you know that's that's simple, very simple to do, but it's blind. I have no idea when I go to awards who whose stake it is because we don't have a way to cross reference it even if we wanted to. So I'm just as, um, when I'm looking around in the crowd, I'm just as excited as anybody. I have no idea who won this thing. Yeah. It, it wouldn't technically, I could cook and, you know, pe- the rep wouldn't know, you wouldn't know who my, or what my stick was. No, no. And that's the way it should be. 
That's spot on. Yeah. So we're halfway through 2019 now. What is 2020 mm-hmm. looking like for the SCA? Well, there's, man, there's all sorts of things going on. We just got um, ACE as our national sponsor in America, and they're, they're looking next year we're going to do the big series at ACE Hardware's around the country here in America. Um, we're already booking new events that we didn't have last year for 2020, and that's something new because usually – people would call three months ahead and now people are starting to go nine months, 12 months ahead. So they're, they're starting to, the calendar is starting to fill up for next year already, which is great. Um, we still got our partnership with ABA over there. Um, I believe we had seven events or eight last year in Australia and we're going to probably be 22 events this year in Australia. Wow. Um, Europe's, Europe's probably, Last year was about 22, and this year I think we're 30, 35, I think, um, somewhere in the 30s. But we also have six whole hog contests in Europe that we run, and we only do whole hog over there. But I think that's going to expand in Europe as well. So it's just more growth in the same areas. Um, we are lucky enough to be chosen to do this uh Legends of the Fire. It's a video series that's about to come out. We just announced it this week. But you got guys like Tuffy Stone on there and David Lee from Butcher's Barbecue and, you know, meatheads on there. That, and food scientists, you probably met him at MBBQA. I did, yeah. But for, for us to be included on that, I'm going to do an hour and a half steak lesson on there. Tim and I will be there and he's going to break down a rib whole rib and cut it into the different steaks and then we're going to cook t-bones and porterhouses and tomahawks and just really have a blast cooking but for us that's big it's gonna we think it'll help open up some doors for us or at least expose us to some people that maybe haven't heard of us yet this is adam from texas barbecue and you're listening to smoking hot confessions If you're looking for your next barbecue smoker or grill, Jagged Woodfired has got what you need. Owners Julianne and Glenn are multiple award-winning barbecue competitors who have even traveled to the US to compete at the World Barbecue Championships in Houston, Texas. Based out of Perth and shipping nationwide, Jagged is one of the largest pit builders in the country and has an ever-growing lineup of meat cooking machinery. Not only do they have their now famous smoker ovens, they are also producing incredibly efficient gravity-fed cabinet smokers and some of the most stylish asado grills you're ever going to see. Jagged is also well known for amazingly detailed custom work, ranging from backyard designs all the way to installations in commercial kitchens. Proudly Australian designed, owned and manufactured, you can find out more at jaggedwoodfired.com.au, spelled J-A-G-R-D. Once again, head to jaggedwoodfired.com.au, spelled J-A-G-R-D, to learn more. All righty, Brett, one of the things I really want to get into with you in this segment is how to get an idea for a competition off the ground as quickly and correctly as possible. So let's say I have an idea, say a, say a, an idea for a game cooking competition. Where do I start? You know, the best place to start would be to reach out to guys that, you know, that are already doing something similar. We, you know, when we started, we reached out to three different promoters that we knew that were running good events and just said, all right, give me some advice on how we could do this. And we kind of relied on them to get started. They're, you know, far as to learn everything we thought we could learn about the event. And then once we were able to put those ideas together, we realized that, hey, there's, there's we think there's a better way to do this. Now, whether it is a better way or not still up for debate, but you know, we, we took all the information we could gather beforehand before starting this and then what made a decision stuck to it. Yeah. Sounds good to me. Now, most of the competition bodies that I've looked at are set up as not for profit. So what are some of the pros and cons of setting up a competition body as a not for profit? Well, actually, SCA is a for-profit organization. Um, we're not a nonprofit. With, to be a nonprofit, there is a ton of paperwork 
um, to fill out. You know, you have a lot of extra paperwork to document where every dollar goes, where everything is spent. So that there's a lot of limitations on what you can do. Now, it, it does open a lot of doors for charitable stuff. People will, are a lot more willing to donate if you are a not-for-profit organization. Uh, we chose to not be a non-for-profit, A, for paperwork, but, you know, when we're going into new countries, that brings in whole another set of rules. And running, for us, running it in different countries, that that would be a big, big, big setback for what we're doing. We still have charities that we support. We're, uh, most of our events support some charity or another. So there's still the charitable aspect to the events. And if someone, we don't run most of the events. We run the judging and we help bring the teams to it. So the promoters, if they want to donate, they're going to donate, or not promoters, I'm sorry. If someone wants to donate to the charity, it's actually, if it's your event, they're donating to your charity, not to SCA. So we, we just run the judging. We help organize the events. We encourage the charities, the events that are charitable, people to donate to them. And it does help the events quite a bit. You know, if you're raising money for breast cancer, it's, it is a lot easier for someone to donate to help support that event than it would be if it was not a charitable event. Yeah, that makes sense. And I'd actually never thought about, um, about the implications of different charity or not-for-profit laws in different countries. So that makes a lot of sense if you are looking to go global to, uh, to make that a profit organization. Honestly, there's probably you can probably do it. There's guys that are way, we way more educated on that than we were when we originally started this thing. You know, that ever we just chose not to go that direction, and uh, it's it has. If we ran every event as the organizer, we probably would be. But we, since we're not, we just chose not to go that direction. Yeah, fair enough. Now you've mentioned that you don't run a board of of directors. You've got just the two of you there, you and Ken. Um, who would I need on my team? What what roles should I be looking to fill? Well, Ken and I have a we've got a pretty good breakdown. I I was the one that does a lot of. I was always pretty good with the computers and um, you know, just talking to people. And so I handle I handle talking to the promoters, the possible new events. I handle the website. So you need someone to handle that end. And then Ken's, Ken's great at the finance. So he handles all the finance for us. And we also have uh, Michelle, my wife, Shelly, that works in the office. She handles all memberships. On our smaller scale, we were able to do, there was three of us. We actually still have three people that run the majority of SCA. I, I talked to 379 different people about their events. Um, so it, Time becomes valuable. I, we're going to have to get more people next year. Um, we had someone in recently to do some of the smaller stuff, you know, creating a flyer and posting the flyer. Um, that allowed me to go out and do some marketing and work with sponsors. But, the, you know, if you've got a, the finance, someone to do finance, someone to do the computer side, because that's important. The social media side is important. And then, you know, the membership side. So we, there's really three divisions of us. We should have probably six, but I like wearing multiple hats sometimes. <laughs> it's a challenge. It, I love it. So what would be those other three divisions? Well, you're going to want some finance, someone to do the IT work, someone to handle memberships, someone to handle just your social media. Um, you need probably one or two people in the office just to handle communications back and forth with the events. I mean, when I open my email in the morning, it sounds like I, you know, it dings and it sounds like a slot machine. It just ding, 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 ding. Here they all come. <laughs> I'm like, Oh boy. You know? And it's like, I have to prioritize. All right, let's start here and go. But we really should have a couple of people in the office just handling that side of it. And, you know, heck I reached out on Facebook yesterday because I have another idea of how to handle our points, you know, just a different way to do it to where once I'm updating them, it'll instantly update on the website, but we're, we're self-taught. We weren't, we didn't go to college to, 
you know, to run a website. But I think having somebody that specializes in, in that would be very valuable. Absolutely. And so once I've got my team together, what, what partnerships do I need to find with the wider industry? You know, in our side, working with different organizations, we have to be friends with all these organizations. We have to find alliances. Um, we're lucky we work with, you know, NBN, the Memphis Barbecue Network. With, we work well with FDA. What we do complements barbecue. We don't feel we contrast with them. It's more of a something different they can offer than another organization out there. So partner with like organizations that don't is a great way to help jumpstart things. And it's really helped us growing in other in new areas. But you've got to have those alliances. You know, there's one organization out there that uh, feels we're now a threat rather than an alliance. And to us, we're, we're still bringing new people to the sport. That's how I got into barbecue. I had a steak. I loved cooking steaks, but I, you know, I wanted another challenge. There wasn't the wide ancillary categories that we have now. So I went and bought a smoker and showed up at a barbecue cook-off and, all right, well, that guy's lighting his fire. I should light a fire. I lit my fire and then <laughs> he pulled his ribs out and I pulled my ribs out and didn't realize I bought the wrong kind of ribs and still turned it in and got fourth place. I didn't know until after the competition I turned in the wrong ones, but that's that's how I got into the barbecue world was through steak. And it's entry level financially. If you've got any of my 37 grills, you can come out there. You can bring a gas grill out there. I mean, if you can beat 40 grown men on a George Foreman, God bless you. Bring out your little George Foreman electric grill. I would love to see that. I'd love to see a George Foreman there at an SCA. <laughs> <laughs> I have one in my office sitting with my collection of grills, actually. Oh, really? So, but it, yeah. Well, people, I mean, you can, we have a, a little group of ours. It's called the Chimney Cartel. And you probably met him at MBBQA also, Vic, Vic. Clevenger. Yep. But Vic started this thing, and we actually ran an SCA event where he had to cook on chimneys. We called it, he called it a Chimney Cartel event. So every team competed on top of a chimney, uh, a charcoal chimney, and put a grate on top. And that's how you competed. So it's financially, if you've got $14 to buy a chimney and you throw a grate on top, you've got a cooking machine. You could win in a bat. We've had guys compete against regular teams that way and get a fifth place. There, there was a guy in Amsterdam, I was there, he dug a hole built a fire in the ground and he cooked on top of the shovel and he got a fourth place. Oh, wow. Well, what was weird was I was on my way home and I started thinking about that. I'm like, did that guy bring a different shovel to cook on? Did he clean the shovel? <laughs> I thought about it all the way home, but he had a shovel and he had charcoal so he could compete. If you're in the barbecue world, you're not going to compete with anybody with a shovel and a bag of charcoal. So entry level into the next level, it, it's, it's bringing people into the competition cooking world. And then if they want to go into barbecue, they can. If they want to be, you know, king of the steak world, they can do that. I think that we'd have to do something sort of equivalent in Australia. It'd be a bag of charcoal and a shopping trolley. We have not seen that yet. So let's do it as long as there's not bin chicken sitting on top of it. <laughs> I make no promises. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> now you mentioned um, social media before. This is something that obviously I'm right into, and uh, I I believe that um, that there's a big uh, role for social media in in barbecue businesses and barbecue organizations. How important have you found it to have a social media strategy? We wouldn't be in Australia if we didn't have that. I mean, we wouldn't be, you know. Like I said earlier, that Facebook has really helped us grow and meet people we would have never met before. And so having a social, we started a radio show. We used to have ribeye radio and then we started doing some live stuff and we called it SCA TV and just getting that word out there and being active on social is very important. You know, we've tried to create a atmosphere with one of our pages that people can ask questions and 
the other one's more focusing on videos and um you know with it's social media has changed the way you advertise you know we don't do a lot of advertising other than that right now or we don't we've we found word of mouth has been great um you know i've been on different radio shows and getting that opportunity like you've given us today is great it it helps expose us to people who, they they may think they cook the best steak around. Now they have an opportunity to come out and cost hundred well, I'm not sure your payouts are a little different there, but you know, in America it's basically it's hundred and fifty dollars. We give you the steak. You know, and then when you win, we post the leaderboard and tag everyone in it and all your friends now to, now get to see, look, man, like that, that's my neighbor. He just won that event. Now you're getting recognition out there. But it's also leading everything back to us as well. Yeah, it's a it's official bragging rights. It is. <laughs> you know, and I I used to have all these trophies on my walls and stuff. I like I kept every little ribbon I ever won. But you know, we're, it's real important those promoters, even down to tenth place, give them a certificate or something. That little piece of paper can mean the world to somebody. Hey, that was my first one right there. That was my first call. You know, there's been events where the promoter didn't do that. And I've actually printed some up, took that event's logo, printed them and mailed them to them. Hey, congratulations. I had first call. Because I, that's, to me, it's important for those cookers to, that's something that hopefully they'll remember for a long time. Yeah, definitely. I've still got my, uh, my first ever little trophy I won for a cook off. Was it? So there you it's, go. It's a tiny little thing. It's only three or four inches tall. I'm actually looking at it right now. It's sitting up in the top of the cupboard. There you go. I had to steal you it back from it. my son because he he saw the little golden cow. He goes, my cow. And so for the, <laughs> next, for the next three years, it disappeared into his bedroom and I was cleaning it up there a few weeks ago and I found it. I was like, right, now it's mine. <laughs> now it's back. Yeah. <laughs> now it's daddy's cow. He's going to jump on the counter and get it one day. It'll be big enough. Uh, yeah, I've got to put it, uh, it's way up high. It's about eight feet in the air at the moment. So I think I've got a little bit of time. There you go. Yeah. (laughs) So see what that little trophy means to you though. Exactly. Yep. And every time I look at it, it puts a smile on my face. There you go. So what are some common problems that I'd need to watch out for? Common problems starting your own deal. You know, You've got, when we started, we watched every penny we had. I mean, it's, we didn't go into this with a budget when we started. It would, it, it would have been nice to go in with a budget, but I mean, we've had to watch finance everything we do. And you know, sometimes that free social media really helps. It helps get the word to different things. But, you know, I hate to say it, but finance is always a, important, really important. You know, when we were, we used to own a recruiting company. Um, we found managers for restaurants. Ken and I did. <clears throat> I started this thing on the side, just ran an event. And then next thing you know, I'm getting calls for events. And Ken was my partner on the other business. And he said, Hey man, you're sure doing a lot of that and uh, not doing a lot of recruiting. <laughs> so yeah, that was a hard conversation, but uh, that's when we said, Hey, let's do that. We'll do both of these together. You know, we'll, we're going to, let's try to build this thing. We only had three events at that point. Um, so let's build it together. So we partnered up on this and that. And um, when we started, it was going, but it wasn't financially where you want it to be. And so I, I had a really tough decision to make in year two. You know, it was either keep doing or, you know, I had to, it was, I, I even hate talking about it, but, it was either lose my personal truck and believe in what I'm doing going forward and keep SCA going, or I had to go back to recruiting. And, uh, you know, had we had that stronger financial backing when we started, had we secured that, it would have been easier. But needless to say, that truck, it belongs to somebody else now. And uh, SCA now has 370 events. And I think I made the right call. Um, I re- replaced that truck with a shiny, bright green car. And, um, we haven't looked back. It was just a decision you have to make when you're in business. You either got to build, believe in what you're doing or it's time to go do something else. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to ask what you're driving now. Oh, it's a, it's a 
2017 Dodge Challenger. Oh, nice. And it's lime, it's bright green. It's, I bought the car sight unseen. I hadn't, I hadn't been to the dealer. I just saw it in a picture and I said, that's my car. <laughs> and yeah, I, I did. And I showed Ken, I said, man, this is, check this out. And he said, that car is you. Cause that's, that's my favorite color. And anyway, so now it says SCA family and license plates. And, uh, if you see that green car coming, you know, I'm going to the event. Yeah, <laughs> and and four states in three days. I dare say that car be moving pretty fast too. It can, yeah. I actually had to jump planes for those trips, but yeah, it's there's times we take long road trips and it's comfortable to ride in anyway. Yeah. Yep. So with six years under your belt now, you've obviously got your uh, your future viability systems worked out. What do I need to do to ensure? future viability in a in a startup basically i'm asking what do i need to do to make sure my event will run a second time you're talking about more so on a promoter side their event or are you talking about are you referring to an individual event if you want to do an individual event are you referring to your organization making sure you're ready for the next one the organization okay um that's you know, assuring an event happens for a second time is really you know, our big responsibility. The promoters, they, as long as we communicate with them afterwards, they need feedback on how their event went. Um, there's, you could have cut corners and got a, a thinner steak or your feedback could have been, hey, you didn't have restrooms. But if we give you the, everything you need to help your event succeed the next year, the feedback, you can change those things and grow from year to year. It's there's not a big difference in a big, great event and a good event, but there's a huge difference between a good event and a bad event. And so just keep constantly making your event better and add things. That's where I think Jay does a great job with Need Stock. He's constantly evolving that thing, and there's different aspects added to the event that help draw in more people. So have measures in place for continuous improvement then? Correct. I, you know, a great resource for SCA has actually been Adam Roberts in Australia. I'm able to ask Adam, you know, he's, he's a pretty successful businessman and he's very intelligent. And so he gives me some great advice. A lot of times I'm like, I didn't look at it from that angle. You know, he just sees things from a different lens. He's, he's actually very much more systems operated than me. He puts a lot of different things in place. Whereas, you know, my dad taught me to work. I got to work harder and the next guy to be successful. So where I will just dive in and make it happen and take on probably more than I should. Adam is, and Adam is smart and he, he'll put, he's better at putting people in places. If that makes sense. Yep. Yep. Recruiting and building a team. Yeah, he's great. You know, that I really respect him. He's kind of one of my mentors on, you know, trying to build SCA. He's given me some valuable ex- advice that has helped us, you know, and he continues to. I just talked to him to yesterday. I love that there's an Aussie connection like that in the SCA. That's so cool. <laughs> you know, he's one of the sharpest guys I've met. You know, he's a big burly barbecue guy and just a – wonderful guy but he man he's you know he ran for he was a politician at one point was in political office yeah he was a counselor i mean yeah yeah, he's sharp and so he's his you know he's they have i think 30 events in aba and his focus has been different than ours um just we're we're more membership driven i believe so we're memberships is mailbox money and just it keeps coming in year to year um you know where they they've got more corporate sponsors on their end i believe and so learning some of the sponsorship aspects has, has been valuable for us as well i don't doubt that at all and being a promoter of you know if you're if you're running your event that's areas we can help help the promoters some of these events go into it and they're the team's if they have five teams, it doesn't matter. They're already financially where they need to be because they are able to get sponsors for the event. They had someone to sponsor the drinks, 
they had a sausage company come in and sponsor the sausage category. Um, the local bank is the title sponsor of the event. So part of my job is making sure you have the tools as a promoter to run your event. We give them some different tips and ideas and that documents ever growing. We, you know, if we have a promoter that's doing something exceptional, we'll write it down, you know, and we'll add it to the list. Here's another way you can help better your event, you know, whether it be social media or, you know, just contacts with local you, local groups like the Boy Scouts or something that could come out, get volunteer hours and actually help the teams load their stuff at the event, you know, help pick up things at the event and they get a credit for uh, service hours. So there's just little things that we've seemed to pick up along the way and that could help a promoter in the future. So good, mate. So good. So I'm going to put you on the spot. What would be your top three pieces of advice wanting to start their own organization? Oh, top three. That's a good one. Um, always probably number one, be smart enough to listen to your people. You know, because the, the cookers have a big voice. We listen to them. Um, find mentors that can help you and guide you on certain things. You know, like I said, Adam's one here. Brad Barrett from Grill Rights is another one. If I have questions, I can call either of those guys, and they'll tell me, you're taking on too much, or they'll tell me, I've done that. It doesn't work. So those mentors are really important in helping, helping grow, you know, personally and the organization. And then uh, the last one... Oh, you need support probably. And it's, you've got to have the family behind you. Cause when, when we started this, you can't, you can't go all in on anything you do, whether it's an organization, whether it's, I don't know, whatever you want to do, you've got to have people behind you. You got to have support of your, your family. And that doesn't seem like it should go with an organization, but it, there's no way I could run, be on the road 49 weekends a year this year and without the support of my wife. And she helps me so much with different things, Ken's wife as well. I mean, they, neither of us could do what we do if it wasn't for the support we have back home. Got a project you'd like to work on with the SHC team? Shoot Ben an email on ben at smokinghotconfessions.com and let's have a conversation. If you want good barbecue, you need good charcoal. And when it comes to charcoal, the denser the wood, the better the charcoal. This is where Dragon's Breath Charcoal comes in. It's made from Australian native Gigi, famous for being the third most dense wood in the world, which means you're going to get 100% quality 100% of the time. The manufacturer of Dragon's Breath Charcoal was founded in 2005 and is the largest charcoal manufacturer in Queensland. A company founded in firm principles and values, the manufacturers of Dragon's Breath seek out opportunities to serve the community, starting with their work in the environmental restoration of Southwest Queensland sheep and cattle stations. Over the years, they've developed dietary charcoal products for livestock and horses and pets. And now there's garden and agricultural soil products that help keep moisture in the soil while it takes CO2 out of the atmosphere. Dragon's Breath Charcoal will be launching on Amazon in November, so stay tuned for more info soon. Alrighty, it's time to wrap it up now with our lightning round. I'm going to ask you 10 quick questions and you can give me some one word or one sentence answers. How does that sound, Brett? Sounds great. Cool. Alrighty, let's get into it. Brisket, fat side up or down? I am a fat side down. Steak, skirt, hanger or other? Ribeye. Of course. Mustard binder on ribs, yay or nay? Nay. Sauce, on the meat or on the side? Can't hide that meat. Put it on the side. Money muscle, is it fantastic or is it overrated? I have a bad comment, but it is fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> what is your nemesis cut? What's the hardest thing for you to cook? Man, the heart, for me to cook, it's a T-bone. A T-bone has two different muscles on it. And they cook at different temperatures, and that bone, the meat shrinks up when you cook, and so it's hard to get them cooked evenly. What's one tip or trick you wish you'd known sooner? Trick? Um, the salt brine. I, I salt brine my steaks. I love it. I can take a select steak and turn it into a prime. 
But if you do, it, it can go wrong really quick if you don't do it right. But I wish I would have figured that out sooner. I waste a lot of money on state. <laughs> I hear you, man. I hear. <laughs> so what do you think is going to be the next trend in barbecue? Steak. <laughs> Actually, I think uh, trend in barbecue, I think they're going to expand it and have some new categories. Are we going to see some tofu ancillary categories at SCA competitions? Um, no, sir. <laughs> I doubt that. <laughs> I'm actually I really relieved it. to hear that. All righty. Question number nine. What's the secret to winning an SCA competition? Cook like you're in your backyard. Oh, Get out of your head. Nice. That should be on a T-shirt. Yeah. That's my advice anytime anybody asks me. And last one. If, if there were a fantasy barbecue league, who would you choose for your team? Well, in fantasy state football, I'd choose, choose Johnny Joseph because he's super consistent. And then I would take some of the female cookers that are out there right now that are in our top 10. They have the ability to not get in their head and go out there and just cook. Guys, we seem to overthink everything. And uh, some of these ladies out there are just incredibly consistent. And I think it's because they just go out there and cook on instinct instead of thinking about it. Perfect. And they probably haven't got that... Uh that male competitive ego that we tend to get as well. Yeah. We used to have one guy on my team and his job was to make sure I stayed lubricated, make sure I had a drink in my hand. Cause if I didn't, <laughs> I tended to overthink. Well, if I was just cooking like I'm in my backyard, got a drink in my hand. The last event I actually cooked was a non-sanctioned one. But he invited me out and I said, well, I'll, I'll cook it. And there was guys that were in the SCA cooking that event. And I said, man, I may be in trouble. There's some of these guys that are, you know, they're winning an SCA. And I didn't know if I could still do it. And I went out there and I was cooking my competition steak. My old Weber, that old blue, and old blue never lets me down. But it doesn't have a basket underneath it to catch the coals. So I caught the grass on fire. I had about a dozen people watching me. I had a fire going. My steak's growing. And I had a crown and coat in my hand. And not a care in the world. <laughs> and I just cut that steak like I always would, didn't worry about anything else. And I won that dang thing. Very cool. Had I, uh, had I worried about everything else around me and all the chaos, I would have been in my head and I would have, I wouldn't have done as well. Yeah. Yeah. You never would have so got there. Just stay relaxed. Yeah. Just stay relaxed. We, we put too much pressure on ourselves. It's, it's a, we're cooking. Cooking brings people together. Why not enjoy it? It is just meat and fire after all, isn't it? That's it. Yeah. That's like that flaming coals out there. It's meat and fire. Just watch it burn. It's great. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, mate, that's a wrap for this episode of the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. So I'm now going to turn the studio over to you. Give some shout outs to whoever you'd like to say thank you to and make sure you tell the listeners where they can track you down on the interwebs. Sounds great. We are the State Cook-Off Association. We are www.statecookoffs.com on the web. Um, we have Facebook page. We have the State Cook-Off Association page. That's going to feature more videos and tips. And then we also have our SCA group page. And the SCA group page is where you can go and, you know, you can throw a question out there. Hey, how do I cook this? And boom, somebody will answer you. If you're coming to our world championship, all you have to do, if you're coming from Australia, put a post on the group page. We always say SCA family, but it really is. A girl yesterday from Europe put her post on there. Hey, I'm coming from, I'm coming from the Netherlands. I want to cook in this event. Can anybody help me? And within five minutes, someone said, I got you. I've got a table. I got a grill. I have everything you need. They're, they're now private messaging each other. And she has what she needs to come and be here. So. If you ever want to come to American Cooking SCA event, just get on that page. We'll take care of you and make sure you have what you need. And the same thing goes when we go to Europe. I've, we've got a standing invitation. If somebody needs something, my buddies in Australia or Europe will provide what they need. So it, it's a big family. You know, we're just out there cooking, having fun, growing together. And you know, we start a fire to people gather. And that's, that's what we've tried to do is just light that fire and let people have a good time together. You can see mom, dad, and then mom, dad, and grandpa all cooking together at the same cook-off. That's very common, you know. I've been a wife competing together outdoors. Their kids are there, not sitting in front of an Xbox. So 
you know, we're hopefully that's what we can bring to the cooking world. We're, we have a lot of creativity and we encourage that in the teams to just go for it. So that's what we're doing. And it seems to be growing a little bit and hopefully we can continue that and more people can come out and cook with their kids in the future. The barbecue family, man, that's what it's all about. So look, once again, thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to be part of the show. And I'm really looking forward to having a beer with you at an SCA comp soon. Sounds good. Thank you for the opportunity and uh, have a great week, bud. And there you have it, family. We've been behind the curtains in the fastest growing competitive cooking body in the world with co-founder Brett Galloway. Huge thanks and appreciation go to Brett for coming into the confessional. It's pretty clear that the man doesn't get much spare time. Before I let you go, I want to remind you about our killer merch lineup, the Smoking Hot Confessions community on Facebook, and if you have a minute, it'd really help me out if you could subscribe, rate, and review the show. The ratings and reviews trigger the algorithms and make Apple distribute the podcast further and wider, so they are really important and very much appreciated. And that's not just the end of the show, but the end of this season. But don't worry, I'll get plenty of Smoking Hot Confessions into your earbuds again real soon. Till next time. Take care of each other and keep on curing. Thanks for listening to the Smoking Hot Confessions podcast. Head on over to smokinghotconfessions.com for recipes, tips, and Ben's own confessions. <laughs>